Welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast, a production from Empowering Pumps and Equipment as the voice of the pump and related equipment industry. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 67 of the Empowering Industry Podcast. This is coming out on August 2nd, and we're happy to be in August. I it's already that far in the year, closer to Christmas, and I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm one of your hosts, Bethany Womack, and I'm joined by my co-host today, Rebecca Mechtensheimer. Thanks, Bethany. We are super excited to be here with you, the listener. Thank you for choosing us, and please do us a favor and leave us a rating and review. That helps us show up in the podcast platforms and also helps more listeners like yourself find our show. And like every week, we're going to keep it on track this week by telling you something you need to know about social media, um, previewing the news from Empowering Pumps and Equipment, and then connecting you with an awesome industry influencer that we have for you today that I'm really excited about. I'm going to start, though. And Becca, how was your week this week? So my week was very good. It was a very creative week, which, you know, I... um, I go in spurts with the creativity, but I personally, you know, made my made my schedule this week to be a little bit lighter on meetings so that I could take that creative time to work on things. So one of the big things is I am working on a new partner offering for 2022. So all of our partners, stay tuned. Uh, we got some exciting stuff coming up for you. I also got to catch up with Charlie for the first time on a FaceTime call, which was super awesome jealous. To see her face <laughs> and see her smile and hear that she's doing well. She is doing very well. So you guys will be seeing her here soon. And I also wrote an article this week and it's about preventative and predictive maintenance, but personal growth edition. So I'm really excited for that to come out next week. And you guys will have to let me know what you think. Becca, uh, (laughs) you're just a super achiever this week. What did I do? I don't even remember. I just (laughs) listened to your awesome week. And then now all of a sudden I'm like, what did I do? Nothing is nearly that cool. (laughs) (laughs) That's not true. You have beautiful babies that keep you busy throughout the week. Um, I do not. So. Um, okay, but I am super jealous that you talked to Charlie. I uh, am trusting that you told her we were all well and that we say hi as well. Um, but then I did do something really cool. I took my own advice that we talked about on the podcast last week about how um, how you should use hashtags more efficiently on Instagram to get a better o- or to get more of your appropriate audience that you want. And I use that advice and I put in my 15 minutes a day for empowering women every day this week. And I every day I do it, I see a new follower, at least one new follower, which like maybe you're saying, oh, that's not that many new followers, but like that's how you get quality followers. And so I was really excited to um, to see the results. I hope that y'all saw results. Um, you, the listener, saw results um, if you participated with me in doing that. And um, then otherwise, it's just lots of thinking about Empowering Women event coming up and how excited we are about that. And so I had a really good week too. Awesome. And um, for the listener, like Bethany puts so much work into empowering women. It's insane. And we are so lucky to have her. Um, so even though she says that her week wasn't as cool, um, she was doing so many things for empowering women. And we need her on the team to be able to do those things because she's much better at it. Well, um, I don't know if that's true, but I appreciate the compliment. And I really hope that... Um, you are a listener. You come to the event, uh, Empowering Women. When it happens in October, it's right after WEF Tech. So if you're planning your trip to WEF Tech, go ahead and think about extending your stay an extra day to stay for Empowering Women. It's a great event where you can learn from other women in male-dominated industries. Um, you can hear topics uh, about negotiations and um Lots of different things that are really important and will really help you in your career. And most importantly, just get to network with this awesome group of women. Uh, Right now, there's early bird pricing. I didn't plan on making this an ad for empowering women, but Charlie's not here to stop me from talking and just rambling, so I'm still going. Um, 
Becca's too nice, but uh, early bird pricing is right now. So you can jump on that. It'll be through the end of August. There's an in-person and a virtual option as well. And uh, we hope to see you there, please. <laughs> um, okay, into social. This is where I'm going to teach you something about social media that you need to know that will help you with either your personal branding or your company branding in social media for the industry this week. And first, we want to invite you to our virtual meetups. So our Empowering Women meetup is on August 11th, which is every second Wednesday of the month, and that's at 11 a.m. Central Time. And then our Empowering Brands meetup is August 17th, which is every third Tuesday of the month, and that's at 3 p.m. Central Time. You need to pre-register for those events. The link is in the show notes. And when you pre-register, you're emailed the Zoom link so you can have it and be there for those events. Be ready to turn your camera on, say hi. Um, I'm hoping uh, maybe we think Charlie might be back on one of those calls, uh, at least to say hi to some people. No promises, but, um, you know, either way, it'll be a good month and we're excited for meetups. Um, oh, so shout outs. It's been a while since we've given Leroy a shout out on this show. He uh, is one of our awesome followers. He, one of the things I love about him is that every week when the podcast comes out on Monday, he gives us a synopsis on our LinkedIn about it and what he learned from it and what he liked. And for one, that's really helpful to be able to get that insight from a listener like you. So I know what you like hearing and, and what you took away from the show. Uh, but then he also sent me a message this morning that said he he thought we recorded on Friday. So he was hoping that I got the message before we recorded and that today is International Friendship Day. And so he and I are international friends, and I think you probably all have a lot of international friends in your network, so maybe give them a shout out and tell them hi, and uh, thanks for being your colleague. Awesome. And so I have a shout out actually today as well. I want to give a shout out to my partner, Steve. Even though he doesn't listen to the show, I'll have to um, send him this clip just so that he sees that Shame I uh, on gave you, him Steve. a little bit of love. <laughs> you don't listen to the show? <laughs> Um, but he's been busy for two weeks now, like every single day working outside on our new patio and it's finally finished and it's beautiful. Like it's so nice. He did a great job and he put a lot of work into it. And so I'm really proud of him and I wanted to give him a little extra love on the show. <laughs> and but, uh, we'll make him listen to this one for sure. Um, I'm going to yes. tell him it's at the very end of the podcast. So he has to listen to the whole thing um, <laughs> to hear his shout out. Yes, there we go. Uh, but we also want to give you a shout out. So reach out to us on social media and we can give you said shout out on the show. You can stay connected with us at Empowering Pumps or using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Okay. Uh, as promised, last week we talked about how to use hashtags on Instagram. And this week I'm talking all about the Instagram algorithm. That's kind of a tongue twister if you try to say it um, too many times too fast. But Everything you would need to know about the algorithm and how you can use that knowledge to then help um, help do marketing for your company, your personal brand, wherever you are in the industry. So just a top level overview. Uh, the algorithm is how Instagram decides what content goes to the top of your feed when you open the app. So what order the stories are in, what order the reels are in, what order the posts are in, and what shows up when you hit the search function. So for content creators like us, like you, if you're running your Instagram for your company, um, it's basically a set of rules that controls your content's organic reach. So the reach it's going to get that you don't have to pay for. Um, so the input that goes into this algorithm to, to determine how much reach your content gets um, is the user's past behavior and then all of the available content that they could possibly see. And they put these two things together and then that determines where you show up in their feed. All of the inputs, all the data points, they're called ranking signals. And so that's the big thing we're going to talk to you about here today. And there are actually three main categories of ranking signals. So the first one is interest. There is no shortcut or anything that you can do that would replace actually posting what is important to your audience. So note that it's important yeah. to post what 
is important to them, not what's important to you. You are there for your audience. And Rocket science, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> people are on social media. They want to see things they like. That's what Absolutely. we post. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and don't be afraid to embrace your niche. And also you want to make sure that you develop a consistent voice and tell people what matters again to them. <laughs> yes. Um, which I will say as a content creator, as like I'm putting out social media content, it is easy to get stuck in a loop of like, I have this product. I want to sell this product. Uh, let me put it out on social media without really thinking about how to frame that in like, this doesn't mean a whole lot to my audience. If they, um, they don't really care about products. They care about their problems and we need to post things that, that, um, that they want to read, which brings us to the second, uh, type of ranking signal, which is all about relationship. So the algorithm assumes that if people have interacted with your content before and your account before, they are going to be interested in new content that you post as well. So they're going to look at things like, do you follow each other? Did they search for you specifically by name and find you? Um, do you tag each other in posts? Do they save your posts and do they message or leave comments? And so when I say, do they save your posts? I didn't know this was a function for Instagram for a while. So if you already know this, just like give yourself a little pat on the back and bear with me while I explain this for people. Um, there's a little flag button at the bottom right of every post where you can click it and it saves. And then you can view all of your saved posts. It's an easy way if you can get your um, audience to use that save function to save your posts. It's an easy way to up the interaction when your post and Instagram really values that as a form of interaction. And it cost them no time, really. Like it's the same as it would cost them to like something. So finding content that would make people want to save it, uh, make people want to message you, comment on things, that's really going to be the top priority that you have um, when you're posting content. And I save things all the time. Um, so that's definitely a, a very good tip. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I even like, I think to personal posts that I save, it's always something like a how to do something for me or something that I want to refer back to. Um, so, you know, like you make a, a pump component, you like tell people like how to clean it. And so you make a post about how to clean their pump. They're going to need that. They're going to save it. They're going to come back to it later. So like thinking of little things like that to get people to save your posts is an awesome way to up your relationship with them. <laughs> yes. And so the, the third one is timeliness. So the algorithm assumes that your most recent posts are the most important to people. So newer posts are often ranked higher than the older ones. When you post to your audience, um, you need to make sure that they're online. And so there are some tools that, you, that can help you figure that out. And, you know, this also means posting on the weekends too. So you don't assume that you're your audience is only on, um, on their social Monday through Friday, because that's just not true as being social beings and, you know, yeah. needing to be connected on that, you know, regular basis. We're on our phones all of the time. And that includes the weekend. So, you know, posting on the weekend too, is always a good idea. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be plugged in and working on the weekend to, to have those posts. There are plenty of scheduling apps out there like Hootsuite. You can just schedule it out and, and have it post on the weekend and you don't have to worry about it. But Shout another out to Amber tip. for doing that for us, all, for our content. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Amber always gets everything in our Hootsuite. So it comes out and um, we love you, Amber. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Amber, because it is. It's it's a job and a half um, to, yeah. to do that. But it, it's important to making sure that you have regular content that is being posted out. And, you know, another tip is that you can, if you do want to post it yourself, is you can have something in draft mode in the app. So this is something that you like already have loaded into your phone on the Instagram app. You can have the, the image and actually the post that you want it to have in there. And then say it's Saturday afternoon and you know you want to post it, you're, but you're out doing stuff. You already have it loaded into your phone. All you have to do is go on the app and go in your drafts and post it. It makes it very easy. Yes. I love that function and use it frequently. Um, 
Okay. So you now understand like what goes into the algorithm and what things they look at when they're determining where you are. But now we're going to talk about um, tips for how you work within that algorithm. Um, also, I forgot to say at the top, I got all this awesome information from a Hootsuite blog. So Hootsuite's the what we use to help schedule things out and they put out great content. So this was updated in June this year. So we can assume that... Uh, that, that most of it is still applicable, although Instagram will change its algorithm some slightly. But all of these tips will continue to help you definitely this year. So the first thing you can do that will help you achieve those things with the algorithm is to post carousels. That's where you have multiple images in one post. So you're posting something and you click um, select multiple images and you do like three, you can do up to 10 actually. But so why this helps you is because like nothing in the algorithm explicitly says that it prioritizes carousels and will make them show up first, but it requires people spend more time on your post. So in order for them to see all the pictures, they've got to scroll through it, through five or six pictures or two or three. And so they're inherently spending more time on it than they are if you just have one image with your post. So Hootsuite says that they see carousels get three times the engagement and 1.4 times the reach. So that's an easy way to get people to spend just even a few more seconds looking at your posts. And you also want to post consistently. So on average, businesses post 1.56 posts on their feed per day. In June this year, um, Instagram said that a posting cadence of two feed posts per week and two stories per day is ideal for building a following on the app. And that really does feel attainable. Like one and a half to two posts a day feels a little unattainable if you're a, you know, uh, just a, a small handful of people running your company or you're, you're a startup. Um, and so I think we can all commit to two posts a week and get some stories out there to share with people. And when you're posting those things, um, you really want to be authentic, which is the next tip. It's kind of a theme that we've been talking through um, through all of Instagram is that like there's really no way to game the system um, that would serve you better than just being authentic and connecting with your people. There, there are ways like people will try to buy followers or they'll use Instagram automation, which are like bots that will go through and comment on posts, which you can always pick them out when uh, a bot, because they're like, share this on this account, blank, blank for followers or whatever. And you know, it's spam instantly. Um, and other than your audience picking up on that, the algorithm is also going to pick up on that kind of stuff. And uh, as soon as they like spot that you're um, that you have some kind of bot or you're not being authentic or you're just copying and pasting all of your hashtags, like we talked about last time, um, it'll move you down um, in their ranking for where you show up for people. Um, and you want quality followers. You want them to interact with you. So you just have to be yourself, be um, who your company mission says you are. Pretty simple. Very simple. And so another one is use hashtags better. So, you know, definitely listen to last week's <laughs> podcast because we talked all about hashtags, but, you know, just for a little recap is don't use spammy ones and making sure that you're finding ones that your target audience is actually using and is applicable for the people that you're trying to reach. Yes. Um, and then you want to try out Instagram's new features. They come out with new features every now and then. You know, we saw stories happen, I don't know, three, four years ago. Um, and now we're seeing reels. They've been around probably about a year. It's kind of Instagram's version of TikTok. It was their response to TikTok. And so the... Um, you know, the official Instagram stance is that participating in Reels doesn't uh, make you show up higher in the other things. But Hootsuite did their own study. And like, as far as we can tell, since it's in like a beta version even still of Reels, it appears that they're currently boosting Reels themselves to get people to see them and to buy into that um, apparatus of that feature of the app. And we saw them do the same thing when they released Stories, which was kind of their version of Snapchat and IGTV their version of YouTube. So um, also fun fact about Instagram Reels right now is that instead of a computer or some kind of, um, 
I don't know, I don't know what you'd call it, code that would sift through everything. Actually, right now, live humans are sifting through reels in order to um, put the in order to get the trending ones towards the top of the list. So ways that you're going to catch those people's eyes if you use all the bells and whistles, you like do the fun things that are available in that feature. Um, and you don't just copy a TikTok that you made that has a TikTok watermark and post it to your Instagram. Now, when I talk about reels, I've never actually made a reel kind of stresses me out a little bit to think about learning something, um, like putting the time into that to do. And so I will say this, like, it's cool to do that if you have time and if you think it will connect with your audience, but like, don't stress. If it doesn't fit into your brand, it doesn't fit into your brand. Um, but if it does and you have like a fun person that loves to do social content that they've got some time on a Friday afternoon, let them go crazy. Let them make the real. It There might be an upside to helping you show up higher in the feeds. Absolutely. And so the last tip we have is to bond with your audience. So a quote from Hootsuite is, Winning hearts is how you win the algorithm. And I think that's very applicable to, you know, just social media in general is you want to appeal to your audience. You want them to like you and um, resonate with the things that you're posting about so that it, you know, of course it, it yeah. helps them and the things that they're able to see and learn, but it also helps you. And, you know, for good engagement Insta on Instagram is about one to 5%, but in 2020 business accounts are at 0.85%. So to increase that engagement, you know, respond to all the comments and DMs that you get, um, as long as, you know, they're not spam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the real people, um, respond to those people and make them so feel seen. Um, also re um, research your target audience so that you know what they do like and what they are interested in and what they are interacting in. So then you know, you know, what you can better support them with, with your own messaging. And then also create an opportunity to share user generated content. So using, you know, a hashtag for the industry, um, that you can use for your posts so that when they, they type that hashtag in, they find all of your stuff. We do that in empowering uh, with our hashtag pump talk. So you, you type that in on any of the social networks, you're going to see us. We are going to be in the feed. We're going to be uh, most of the posts, but then also a lot of other people um, that are pump manufacturing in the industry yeah. and, and different people that work on pumps. It's, it's been really great to see over the past, you know, 10 years that we've been able to, um, kind of make this hashtag our own and, and monopolize it to an extent to where it's, you know, it, it's industry speak. Yes, you will occasionally see some weird stuff that is not applicable to the industrial sector, but for the majority, it is all our stuff and the industry as a whole. And then when we see those things, you'll frequently see us retweeting people that have used that hashtag or they're posting something on Instagram that they've used that you'll see us sharing that content as well. And I just love pump talk because 10 years later, like we're still seeing um, like awesome things come from using it that there's no way Charlie could have like thought to herself, like, you know, this is going to help me in the Instagram algorithm 10 years ago. Um, but having the forethought to like, know that hashtags were going to be a thing and they were going to be huge and like to create one that we could really use for the industry. It's just like really fun to, you know, see the evolution of it, I guess. Um, like you said, over 10 years, um, just crazy. Um, okay. But so just like kind of sum up all that we've been talking about, um, for the Instagram algorithm. And then even last week when we were talking about hashtags and how to use them to get the right audience is like, just my very long winded way of saying that you need to be authentic and post things that your audience wants to see, not just what you want to sell. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, marketing 101 and sales 101 when you when you think about how you're communicating with your tar target audience. Um, and so that just gets us out of that selling mindset and into that relationship building mindset. And Maybe you don't run a business Instagram. Maybe you don't do that for your company, but you're building your personal brand. 
or you know, you just use Instagram for fun. I hope that you got out of this conversation. Like maybe you understand why you're seeing those weird posts when you hit the search bar now because you've interacted with something. So if you don't like seeing those ads for socks, maybe don't like a sock post when you see it come up. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Are we good? I think we're good. Um Awesome. I mean, I feel like I could just keep talking about Instagram forever, but we'll move into the news. This is where we're going to preview the news that you'll see in your inbox from the Empowering Pumps and Equipment e-newsletter coming to you this week. We're going to start with the person of the week. Oh, and I'm so excited because... Um, the person of the week this week is a dear friend of mine. It's Jennifer Salas. She's a mechanical mechanical design engineer at Solzer Turbo Services here in Houston. Um, I knew her from my days at Texas A&M. She was a student at the Turbo Lab while I was the marketing director for the Texas A&M Turbo Lab while I was there. Um, since then, she's been to Empowering Women. Uh, she's also married to a, a Turbo Lab graduate as well, who's an engineer working in the industry. And I hope he listens to this and they can have a little fun about who got featured first as person of the week, because it was def definitely Jen. Um, but so one of the fun answers that she shared was that she said she's most proud to work, proud of the people that she gets to work with, um, whether it's her coworkers or customers, from the passion they put into their work, into the abundance of knowledge waiting to be shared. There's always someone to be inspired by or a person to push you to challenge yourself. And I just felt like that's a really beautiful picture of the industry and how um, I view it and how I hope that you view it, the listener views it as well, and that that's why you come here and you're getting all of that out of these stories that we're sharing um, from people. And um, anyway, add her on LinkedIn. She's awesome. You'll want to follow her. Yes. And to read her full story, you can check that out on our website and definitely nominate someone else that you know that you think that also deserves a little spotlight on them. Awesome. So the story that I'm going to be previewing for you this week is entitled Extending the Life of Energy Efficient HVAC Equipment. It comes to us from our partner, InproSeal. They share lots of great content with us that we're happy to be able to provide for our readers and for our listeners here today. Um, so the article goes through an experience from a leading plastic injection company. They installed a variable frequency drive, VFD, um, on their chiller pumps to increase energy efficiency and reduce operating costs. VFDs, they're increasingly popular in the HVAC industry, but they've been known to induce high frequency voltages that when they discharge the ground through the bearings and over time, those discharges can cause premature bearing failure. Um, and so a solution for that problem is to provide bearing protection. When added to the VFT installation, um, to safeguard the equipment and your investment so you don't have as much downtime and Thanks to the bearing protection that ImproSeal provides, um, the customer in this example, they were able to enjoy, you know, the energy efficiency and the cost saving benefits of the VFD um, without the fear of the premature bearing wear, um, motor failure, expensive downtime, all of that. Um, the article goes into more detail on how exactly it worked and how it worked in this specific instance. I'll include that link in the show notes so you can read through it and learn some more about um, how to extend the life energy efficiency of your, H of your HVAC equipment. And so the article that I picked out from this week's news is a tech note on radial cutting mechanisms versus axial cutting mechanisms from crane pumps and systems. So this article is all about grinder pumps. Grinder pumps are often used in low pressure sewer systems, and they are a critical feature um, to, you know, be to the uh, sewer system because of that grinding technology. So, you know, this is a cutting mechanism that tends to come in two forms, which is axial and radial. So the radial cutting mechanism is a more traditional style of solids reduction in grinder pumps. The radial, radial grinder pumps can be more susceptible to clogging or jamming on items such as wipes or other flushable items, or I should say not flushable, even though the label sometimes says <laughs> flushable. Shouldn't be um, flushable. I had a plumber tell me that the other day when he, like, we had a tree root through our thing. And I was like, I don't flush anything, I promise. 
<laughs> I know better. I listen to the Empowering Pumps podcast. Have you heard it? <laughs> Yes. Don't, don't flush wipes or anything yes. else that says that it's flushable. Um, cause you know, this, this can potentially, um, stop the pump from running and that's not good. We don't want that. Um, but part of, you know, these, these cutting mechanisms are what do help those things that get flushed that maybe shouldn't have gotten flushed. So then we have axial cutting mechanisms. So axial cutting mechanisms were engineered to combat the evolving waste stream. So the axial cutting mechanism nibbles away at the solids until they are completely reduced without the risk of oversized or challenging items stretching across and clogging the cutter. So crane pumps and systems also does a lot of um, chopper pump videos where they show all of the different things going into the pump and it obliterates it. It's awesome. Um, so if you want to learn more about these different cutting mechanisms, definitely check out the article on our website um, as well as the ImproSeal one um, and all of the other great news that we will have in this week's newsletter. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, it's Those videos are very cool to watch. Can can um attest to that because I also enjoy watching them. Uh, it's just fascinating uh, what our industry has been able to do to solve problems. Okay. So the industry interview, Charlie did a bunch of these before she was out for us. And we have an amazing interview for you today. Uh, it's with Hillary Johnson. She's an MIT doctoral student who just won the Limelson MIT student prize probably not saying that correctly, but um, she solved a big problem related to hydraulic pump inefficiencies and invented an entirely new kind of centrifugal pump called the variable volute pump. Uh, the interview is amazing when you start talking to someone who literally invented a new kind of pump and uh, just forever changes the landscape of the industry and what, uh, what pumps can do and all those kind of things. And she's young and excited and it's just really, I think it's a great interview where you can see the future of the industry and where we're moving and to hear how her, uh, invention process went as we're moving into inventors month, which is, uh, August. So, uh, Charlie had the foresight, foresight to put that together. So thank you, Charlie. But just super great interview that I think you're going to like. Awesome. And yes, I love the first podcast of August is um, about an inventor. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the interview. And without further delay, here's the interview. Hi, Hillary. Thank you so much for joining me on the Empowering Industry Podcast. I am just, I don't know, I'm thrilled because I get to have this interview with you, first of all. Uh, so that's a special treat for me. And then we get to share it with everybody. Let's start with you telling everyone who you are and what you're doing. Absolutely. Charlie, thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor. I've followed you for a number of years ever since I got into pumps. So this is like, you know, kind of a dream. Um, this makes me so happy. Anytime. I mean, <laughs> students have told me this before, but every time I'm shocked. So thank you for bringing that up and, and that we can be a resource for you. That's really what we want at Empowering Pumps. So, um, so Hillary, um, it's, it's Johnson, Hillary Johnson, everybody. Yeah. And, uh, again, tell us what you are up to these days. Yeah. Well, yeah, Hillary Johnson, and I am currently a graduate student at MIT in mechanical engineering. And I actually, I never thought I would end up doing a PhD, but here I am. My advisor sometimes jokes that it stands for permanent head damage. And um, <laughs> the, the local joke is that Hillary is pumped about pumps, which I certainly am. Um, I, I used I'm to say all the time, Hillary, I'm pumping the positive. So there's always some kind of lingo that goes in there. Uh, I love that. In this industry. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fun to teach all my peers about pumps because some of them use it in their experimental setups, but I'm one of the few people who are, who's doing research on inventing new types of pumps and, and really kind of thinking about how do we push the envelope of what does it mean to be reliable and efficient and adjustable. Um, so I, here I do precision machine design and turbo machinery and fluid dynamics, um, which are all components of, of pumps. And um, I love nerding out about that. 
We will um, do that now. We will do that. Don't worry. Um, before we get to that, though, I do want to know why pumps and why did you get into this space? Yeah, I came to MIT to really work for one person. His name is Alex Locum. If you Google him, he always wears crazy Hawaiian shirts and is just an incredibly influential person in the world of precision machine design. So I came to work for him and was thinking I'd just graduate after my master's degree, which I worked on something totally different, like lectures on a Braille label maker. Um, and then I helped really write a proposal for this um, improving pump efficiency and reliability that was going to be a collaboration with Xylem. Um, and we wrote the proposal. They ended up selecting it. And my advisor kind of looked at me and said, hey, would you, would you like to stick around? Would you like to work on pumps? And I thought about it, and it was really the right mixture of getting to be really innovative, but also getting to collaborate with an industry leader um, and being able to learn from all of their knowledge and then also bring kind of the MIT flair of um, wild out-of-the-box thinking and design and kind of the opportunity to do some R&D that, that maybe wouldn't exist within a traditional company. Yeah, there's so many people in our network um, that went to MIT. I can't wait to connect you with them um, all over and to see what you do next, but Let's talk about the pumps for a minute because I was just, first of all, um, you know, an engineer who, a young professional, a young woman engineer, and then you are actually working on the pumps. It makes me do a hip, hip, hooray. I am just so <laughs> happy about that. But let's show everybody what you know, right? And let, let's talk a little bit about the pump and what you are trying to um, adapt for the pumps. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we really started out with an equation on a piece of paper um, and looking at the Euler turbine equation and then also at um, how, what gives us control over a pump. Right now, the major thing that an industry professional might be able to control is the speed of the pump. Or maybe you install two pumps um, in parallel or in series to give you some adjustability in a system. Um, but what I saw is that there's this other variable that we've always thought would just be constant, which is the volume of the pump itself. So not changing the impeller, but the actual casing, which a lot of people consider to be maybe the boring part because it kind of gets bolted on there and it's static and it doesn't change. And so the, the early insight of my work was that if we can change the actual volume or the casing of the pump um, and adjust that in size, that we could then actually influence the efficiency of that system. Um, and so it gives you a, a compatible or um, a control parameter that could work together with variable speed pumps or could work independently and allows you to actually adjust the flow to the to the system that you're operating on. So um, I'm just always happy when you talk about something that I understand a little bit about. So yeah. for years, we talk about the best efficiency pump point um, and, you know, what is that? And you, we, we have talked about changing the impeller up. So basically what you're saying, now we're going to look at the opposite of that, right? And, and, and kind of the other side of where the, where the fluid flows, if you will. And exactly. so it's just a different way of thinking, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. And um, I really am so grateful to some of the hydraulic engineers at Xylem. They taught me everything I know about the fundamentals of pumps and how to design them. And one of the, the things that any pump designer knows is that you design the spiral chamber inside of that casing for a particular best efficiency point. And so the kind of simple, the, the like fundamental idea behind my innovation is that if we could then change that volume, it's basically like being able to design the perfect pump for whatever flow you're at. And so it allows that matching be between the flow rate and the casing. And so that's what gives us... Um, Actually, the current prototype I'm working on has a 6x range compared to the baseline pump that I was designing off of. So typically, a pump might be operated from 85 to 110% of the best efficiency point. My pump that I'm experimenting on can be operated from 20% to 200%. Wow. Okay. So everybody's mind just blew in the pump industry, yeah. right? Um, but I had a question about how you got involved with Xylem. Did you know somebody? Did, were they um, part of MIT? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, there's a, um, a great center here at MIT called 
um, JWAFs, which they um, coordinate and bring together a lot of the research around food and agriculture and um, food, water and agriculture. And so they really, Xylem came to them wanting to develop academic industry partnerships and collaborations. And so they kind of put out this call for proposals um, broadly to MIT professors saying like, give us your best ideas around um, what could be an innovation in the pump world. And I think they were a little surprised that we came back with something about pumps because right now sensors or control algorithms are maybe more the more sexy topics in, in the pump world. Um, but we were really excited about the fundamentals of, of being able to create a whole new control parameter that could really impact how an operator or a designer creates the, the system in which these pumps are operating. It really is what we've been talking about for years. There's really no innovation around pumps. You're thinking about how can it integrate with an entire system and that's where the innovation would come in. So um, me too. I think that's a, a really great way to kind of re-energize the pump industry. Let's see what we can do. And so how long did it take you this research that you've been doing? I've been working on it for three years now. Okay. So it's been, we took it from, like I said, an equation on a piece of paper to really early prototypes um, that we actually tested in the facilities with Xylem. And then I've built a, a small flow loop here at MIT. And I'm using a combination of machining and 3D printing to create prototypes and do this very iterative, iterative process of building the mechanism and then testing it out. And actually just this morning, I was, um, I was working on collecting some of the data around, okay, what we know that it has an efficiency gain and a reliability improvement. Okay, now I need to quantify that. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. Yeah, I was wondering where you were when you came on because you were definitely in the thick of working. And so this is at MIT um, and what you have created so that you can test these things. Yeah, amazing, amazing. amazing. <laughs> I've got my steel toes on, got my safety glasses. Um, well, so. we were just we were just um, talking about uh, workwear and all the different kinds. So you know, you gotta you make sure that safety is involved. But I guess when I'm thinking about you and kind of you have your whole life ahead of you and you're in pumps, I want to keep you in pumps, of course. Uh, but what do you want to accomplish with um, your career? That's a great question. I I've been telling everyone that I'm still in the divergent phase of figuring out what's next. Um, yeah, I think there's so many incredible opportunities at this kind of water and energy nexus. And I certainly want to be working at that, at that combination of water and energy. I would really love to see this pump that I've been working on become real. And I think that is Xylem's intention. And so we're talking a little bit about what next steps look like on how do we transition this out of the lab and into the field? And what does that product development process look like? Um, I'm really excited about that. And also thinking about um, what are maybe like smaller companies that I could look at, but really excited about water. Um, it even, even before grad school, um, I was, I went to high school in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is a long story, but um, I care a lot about water. Tell me for... about that. Okay, wait, wait, <laughs> no, no, we can talk about it. Uh, so you went there and was it just a visit or you weren't at school there? I, I went to a high school in Bosnia and Herzegovina for two years called the United World College in Mostar. And there were 100 students from about 30 different countries at my high school. And we were all in full scholarship. So people came from crazy different backgrounds. And the idea was to live and work and play next to each other from different cultures and countries and to learn about their lives and their families and where they came from. And so that has given me a ton of empathy for um, people who have come from places without the same level of access to water and infrastructure that um, I've had growing up here um, in the States. And, and also even here, like we have such um, huge droughts that we're facing in a lot of the West Coast. Um, and I've often thought that pumps are essential both when we have too much water and when we have too little. And, um, and so I really see that as an infrastructure and huge challenges. We face climate change and, um, and infrastructure, kind of infrastructure of the future. Yeah, absolutely. And we need great minds like you that can uh, and have had those experiences um, to look at different cultures because we're uh, we're in this together. We've heard that, you know, for, for a long time, but in, in the water and in our resources, that's absolutely true. Um, so many people I just want to introduce you to. It's so, it's so fun to meet you. I look and, forward to it. Yeah. And so, you know, I think you know, when I, when I look at you as uh, a woman in the pump industry, 
uh, in the future of that, because you are just being yourself, you're owning this and you are, um, you know, creating something, inventing something. So it's Inventors Month when this is going to go out. And what does it feel like to be in that space and inventing? I mean, what is, what is it like? I think I always have, I'm a bit of a shorter woman. And um, so I always have to like first like develop my street cred. And um, as I was telling you a little bit before, like I, I recognize that I'm coming from MIT. And so I know a lot of the technical background. I've done a lot of reading, but also there's so much experience boots on the ground that I'm still gaining. And so there's a humility that comes with that. And, um, and so I, are you I able try, to do that? Are you able to get out into some of these plants, Is, like the manufacturing plants or even the, the utilities and things? Every chance I get. Um, it's been a huge part of my education is um, is going and, and walking the plant floor or um, walking the machine shop floor, or the both on the manufacturing side um, has really influenced my thinking and invention. And then also on the implementation side, like, for example, the Boston wastewater treatment here, the treatment plant here in Boston has these huge, um, I've been huge there. pumps. Yeah. They're so awesome. And talking with their engineers, um, has been a great collaboration and learning. Um, and if anyone on the podcast wants to give me a tour of their facility, I would love to show up and learn from you. Yes. Yes. Uh, I love a plant tour. It's one of the best ways to learn and see what the challenges are, uh, get your hands dirty a little bit and, or not, you know, gloves are actually better. Uh, yes. so, so definitely have that proper workwear, but you know, I just think it's number one, fascinating that these programs exist, um, that are bringing in our, our younger workforce. And then after that, you know, when we go into, what are we going to do that, it, that you're staying there, you're staying there to be a solution for us because that's where we are. That's what the sustainable aspect, it has to be new minds and new ways of thinking. So thank you for doing that. I'm excited about the pump and how it, it turns out uh, yeah. as far as the new design, but just as we've been talking, is there anything else that's kind of on your mind that you wanted to share? That's a good question. I, I think I have so much respect um, for folks who are on the ground, people who are operating pumps, people who are designing them, people who are um, designing the systems that they're a part of. And um, I think before I got into this industry, I had no idea everything that was going on behind the scenes to make sure that I could turn on my tap and have clean water or that our wastewater could just be magically taken away. And so I think everywhere I go, all my friends and family and community now knows way more about pumps than they than they did and i think it's such an underappreciated but essential part of society that that pumps are are running i think two fun facts um pumps consume six percent of u.s electricity so that's almost equivalent to 56 hoover dams worth of electricity every year um and so it's just then that connection between the energy that we're consuming and the pumps that we're running and the water and and then also reliability are also interconnected and so i have a lot of appreciation and respect. And also I see it as a huge area for, um, of innovation going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with bright minds like you. Uh, well, so thanks, yeah, so I think it's great to, to be in the water industry and it's definitely actually waters in most every industry, right? Cause it's everywhere. We need it for all kinds of things. Um, is there anything else that's kind of has your attention outside of that space? Oh, definitely. Actually, um, I'm so thankful to the Lemelson Foundation for the recent recognition of my work. And um, it's been really special seeing the en other inventors um, in the like curiat category or the move it category. Um, and so I see my peers who are doing microfluidics. So using the same fluid dynamics that I'm using, but looking at um, even COVID vaccines, but also um, looking at cures for diseases or how we're doing sampling of wastewater um, for epidemiological reasons. So I, there's so much work there. And then also in the desal space um, and water. Okay, these are all still water things, but um, <laughs> she it's, loves it's water. <laughs> it's incredibly, it's really inspiring to be here around MIT. And um, I machine most of my own parts. And so walking through the machine shop and seeing like the cool robot that one person's making and the new metal 3D printer that somebody else is making and the new like small Did anybody hear stuff. that? She machines her own parts. I mean, I do. Actually, 
here, here's a part I recently machined. Awesome. Um, this is a base plate to my to my pump, and I'm actually taking data all around the spiral to be able to understand pressures inside of the pump. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when do I get to meet you is the question, right? Like I cannot wait uh, to, to meet you. I would you. love that. Yeah. So I'm going to have to put that on my list. Um, and as far as when you graduate, is that coming up? Is that a, like, are you close? I mean, I yeah, assume. I'm at the yeah. end of the marathon. I'm like less than six months out from graduation. Okay. That's the goal. Okay. So we've got to get her, we got to get her networking today. Uh, <laughs> So y'all go ahead and mention, so we, this is on the podcast. We can, they can mention you and our podcast at Empowering Pumps, but awesome. uh, we'll put all of the information, your information uh, in the show notes. so people can contact you. Um, is there any specific way that you prefer people reach out? Oh, that's a great question. Um, email is fine. Mm-hmm. Hillary J at MIT.edu. Um, LinkedIn is also great and fine with me. Um, I also have a portfolio website um, where I tend to post um, the projects I'm working on. Um, so it's Hillary and a Johnson.com. Yes. Um, and so we'll, are, we'll definitely push. I've already checked it out. It's super cool. Uh, yeah. So it's just, I keep saying this, I'm just so excited. And I think you started off the conversation like that because uh, you, for me, getting to meet you via this platform um, means that our work is actually doing what it's supposed to, right? So connect, inform, and educate the industry is what we're trying to do. Um, And it's just, that's what we, that's how I can't even talk today, but basically it's just so exciting to see that it's working and you can connect and grow um, together. I mean, that's, that's what it's about. So if there are, I guess, is this tied to one manufacturer? Um, the, so going back to the pump technology and what you're designing. So Xylem has kind of funded this program so that you can work on it or mm-hmm. accepted the proposal. Um, is that over when the, when it's, is that so over I, when the, when you graduate? Is that how it works? Like through graduation? Yeah. Okay. So um, MIT went ahead and patented the invention, um, which is really exciting. And so um, I think Xylem is hoping to and intending to license that patent and to move forward with creating a product okay. out of this. Um, I really see my invention as the first in a new category of pumps. So I, I fully envision a number of other mechanisms in this space now that we've begun thinking about how can a variable pump actually improve both the efficiency and the reliability, as well as the operating range, like I mentioned. And so that I think that kind of trifecta is really exciting. And um, so I think it will be a whole new category of pump. I love it. And I can't see what's, I can't wait to see what you do next, because it, it, no matter what, you're going to be thinking outside the box. You have all of that background um, and experiences with other people that's going to help you. And I think that's what we need. And, and I'm just happy that you're here. So Thanks for joining me today and I look forward to meeting you. We're, we're going to keep that on the list and, and just yeah. follow your path, right? Oh, thank you, Charlie. I really, this has been so great. I love following Empowering Pumps on both Instagram and Twitter. I almost feel like my, those, those for me are such professional things now that I'm like, oh, cool pump updates. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we love that. And if you ever want to like, you know, share your little insights, I don't know, you can't share all of it because you're, you know, working on the patent and all that, you know, that's, but whatever you can, whenever you can show yourself as a role model for others, I love that. So just even your picture today, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, she's really working. She's in the field. You know, these things make me really excited. And it's because I think I'm also jazzed up. We just were in Chicago for a photo shoot of, for women in trades and, um, oh, women in industry. And it just makes me happy to see the diverse group of women in our industry. So you're just adding to that and, um, just thank you. So I appreciate your work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I really am so thankful for the many mentors I've had. Um, Many of them men um, who have been awesome advocates for me as a female engineer. And then a few really great women who have just, I've looked up to and followed in their footsteps. So both, I think, as maybe one last thing I want to say is like, to maybe all the men who are listening to this podcast, um, some of my best mentors have been other men um, in the pump industry, in particular, a lot of the hydraulic engineers at Xylem who 
um, took me into the lab, taught me how to run a pump operational test, like taught me how to, you know, how to design a lot of these components and, you know, took me to lunch every day and I got to hear the shop talk and I learned so much faster because of their mentorship and just bringing me along and not making me feel any different than one of the crew. And so um, that's been really powerful in my life is, um, is that sort of mentorship. I love that. Thank you so much. Mentors, <laughs> Hillary's mentors. Thank you. And yes. I agree with you. There are so many men in our industry that are wonderful and, and supporting us and, and you and I, we're, we're women, but that doesn't mean, you know, that we can't support everyone. And I totally. am really, really happy um, to have those role models and to have awesome engineers. I mean, that's, that's basically that's your title. You've already, you've already accomplished that and, you know, continue on with your research and your innovation. It's going to be great. Oh, thank you, Charlie. This is so good. And we're back. Charlie, thanks so much for arranging the interview. Hillary, thanks for being on the show. Uh, everyone connect with her so you can uh, keep following what's going on in her world. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. Do us a favor, subscribe, rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. Uh, leave us some comments so that we know what you took away from it. Or be like Leroy and sum summarize the podcast uh, for other listeners so they know what they're going to get. And you can always reach us through social at Empowering Pumps or using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Or you can always reach out to us via email at podcast at empoweringpumps.com. We'll be back every Monday with a new episode. And until then, be empowering. I'm in the playroom recording. <laughs>